For a tale that was so important, they carved it in their stones at the Temple of Sais in Neith, Egypt. It has since been gone. It was taken out by the Nile River. Those stones are surely at the bottom of it somewhere. It seems to me that there are certain aspects of this story that are real. It'll mean a journey of 1,200 miles over rock and sand, by vehicle, camel, and on foot. And it's a dangerous journey. They call it the Land of Fear. It takes its name from the Arabic word for emptiness, Al-Zahara. The vast area that was submerged during the end of the Ice Age has never been studied by archaeology at all. And they're not in a position to say that they know that there's no possibility of a lost civilization during the Ice Age. While they haven't investigated those 27 million square kilometers that are now underwater, when they haven't investigated the Sahara Desert. When we think of the Sahara Desert, we think of endless sand. But what really lays beneath all the sand? The Sahara Desert, it's like a time machine preserving the ancient history of Earth under all that sand. The Nubian civilization, flourishing in what's now Sudan and southern Egypt, is an incredible chapter of history that's often not as highlighted as it should be. This civilization, which stretched from around 2000 BCE all the way to 350 CE, shows us just how advanced and rich in culture, architecture and politics an ancient society could be. Imagine a civilization that lasted over two millennia, peaking during various periods like the Kingdom of Kerma, the Napatan period, and the Meroitic period. Nubia was strategically located along the Nile River, stretching from the first cataract in southern Egypt to the sixth cataract in central Sudan. This prime location along the Nile was not just for show, it played a huge role in establishing Nubia as a powerhouse of trade and economic activity. They were known for their abundant gold mines, which pretty much made them the go-to spot for luxury items like ivory, incense and ebony. These goods were highly sought after in both sub-Saharan Africa and the Mediterranean world, making Nubia a crucial hub in ancient trade networks. In fact, that was one of the main arguments that the archaeological police used to try to dismiss John West and Robert Schock. Um, they said, uh, show us another culture that's 12,000 years old anywhere in the world and we might listen to you. But we know that there is no culture capable of creating anything like the Sphinx until 4,500 years ago. Therefore, of course, the Sphinx is 4,500 years ago. But of course, that changed completely with Gobekli Tepe, which is uh, a deliberately buried site, deliberately buried 11,600 years ago. Now let's talk about Nubia's relationship with ancient Egypt. It was nothing short of complex and fascinating. The interactions ranged from trade and cultural exchanges to outright warfare and conquests. There were times when Nubian pharaohs actually ruled over Egypt, especially during the 25th dynasty. This period is a testament to Nubia's strength and influence in the region. The kingdoms of Nubia, nestled along the Nile in what's now Sudan and southern Egypt, really tell us a story of an incredibly rich history, full of architectural wonders. Let's take a closer look at what made these kingdoms so remarkable. Starting with Kerma, dating way back to around 2500-1500 BCE, it's fascinating to think this was the first centralized state in Nubia. It was more than just a political hub. Its strategic location on the Nile made it a hotbed for trade. The architecture here was quite unique too, with large mud brick structures called defufas. Their purpose? Well, that's still something of a mystery. Were they temples, palaces, or something else? And let's not forget the artistry in their pottery and crafts, especially the black-topped red ware and their work with ivory and gold. Then there's Napata, around 1300 BCE, which really left its mark as a cultural and religious center. This is where Nubia began to exert its influence over Egypt, especially during the 25th dynasty. Think about the Temple of Amun in Napata. It wasn't just a religious site, but a pivotal spot influencing Nubian culture and politics. And the royal burials of this time, with pyramids at sites like El Kuru and Nuri, show just how much Egyptian culture influenced them. Fast forward to around 300 BCE, 350 CE, and we see the capital shifting from Napata to Meroe. This move wasn't just geographical. It signified a shift in political and cultural power too. 
Meroe was a hub for the arts and industry, known especially for its iron industry and the development of the Meroitic script, an early African written language outside of the Egyptian hieroglyphic system. Part of now the problem is that very ancient structures, thousands of years older than archaeologists suppose, may be hiding in plain view, surrounded by other younger structures. And the best example of that really is the, is the Great Sphinx of Giza. And these two temples, these two temples in front of it, this temple is just is a New Kingdom temple much later even than the accepted date of the Sphinx, but, which is about 4,500 years ago. But the Sphinx and these two temples are deeply anomalous. Now let's talk about the architectural marvels of Nubia, the pyramids. Yes, Nubia had over 200 pyramids, mostly concentrated at places like El Kuru, Nuri and Meroe. These weren't like the Egyptian pyramids we often think of. They were smaller, with steeper sides, and often featured elaborate carvings and hieroglyphics. These pyramids were royal tombs and the burial chambers beneath them were often richly decorated. These pyramid complexes, part of larger royal cemeteries, included mortuary temples and chapels, showing a deep belief in the afterlife. The Garamantes civilization, centered in what's now southwestern Libya's Fezzan region, is a real eye-opener about how advanced ancient societies were, especially in such challenging environments like the Sahara. This area, known for its oasis environments, was crucial for sustaining life, and the Garamantes were pretty ingenious in adapting to these harsh conditions. So picture this. From around 500 BCE to 700 CE, the Garamantes were at their peak. This wasn't just a flash in the pan, it was a long period of development and stability. They were ahead of their time in agricultural techniques, urban planning, and establishing far-reaching trade networks. It's like they were the ancient masters of making the desert work for them. Archaeological digs in the region have unearthed some pretty cool stuff. For starters, they found these elaborate tombs, which really say a lot about their beliefs in the afterlife, something many ancient civilizations had in common. The complexity and size of these tombs also tell us there was a social hierarchy with different levels of wealth and status. The goods buried with the deceased give us a peek into their cultural practices and beliefs. The ruins of Garamantian cities are something out of an ancient urban planner's dream. They had organized street layouts that show a high level of social organization and civil engineering skills. What's more impressive is their water management systems. In a place as dry as the Sahara, they managed to create reservoirs and irrigation systems, which were crucial for their survival and agricultural activities. Plus, they had defensive structures hinting that they were prepared for potential threats. Now let's talk trade. They found Roman coins in the excavation sites, which means the Garamantes had trade connections with the Roman Empire. Imagine the caravans going back and forth across the desert. They also found Egyptian amulets and items from sub-Saharan Africa, showing that their trade network was vast and varied. The diversity of goods found at these sites underscores their role as a major trading hub and their interactions with different cultures. Uh, and weirdly, up there near Cusco, we have this curious stonework and we also have it at Alakahoyuk in Turkey. Exactly the same kind of thing. Is this a coincidence or is there something going on behind the scenes of history that we've not been fully informed about yet? Um, and, and, and oddly, these, these patterns, these T-shaped pillars that we see at Gobekli Tepe are repeated at the Temple of Edfu in Upper Egypt and uh, also in Peru. Now moving on. Tassili Najer in Algeria is truly one of those places that take you back in time, all the way to the early days of human civilization. Nestled in southeastern Algeria, right in the heart of the Sahara Desert, this area is a treasure trove of history. Picture this, vast sandstone formations, cliffs, deep valleys and rock shelters. It's not just a stunning natural landscape. These features have been key in preserving some incredible prehistoric rock art. Now let's talk about this rock art. It's not just a few drawings here and there. We're talking about artwork that dates back to the Neolithic period, some as old as 12,000 years. Discovered by a French military expedition in the 1930s, these paintings give us a fascinating glimpse into the lives of the people who lived back then. You've got human figures, wild and domestic animals, and scenes that show everything from hunting and gathering to dancing and rituals, 
What's really interesting is how the art changes over time, starting with wild animals and hunting scenes and gradually moving to domesticated cattle and herding. It's like a visual story of how these ancient folks transitioned from hunting gathering to pastoralism. But it's not just about the art. Archaeologists have found all sorts of tools and pottery in Tassili Naja, indicating that people have been living here for thousands of years. These artifacts range from simple stone tools used by hunter-gatherers to more sophisticated items linked to settled communities. It's amazing how much you can learn about past lifestyles and technological progress just by looking at these objects. Now let's not forget about preserving this incredible site. Tassili Najer was declared a UNESCO World Heritage Site in 1982, which is fantastic because it helps in getting the support needed for its preservation. But keeping this site in good shape isn't easy. The art is facing threats from natural erosion and potentially even climate change. Plus, there's the impact of tourism. Sure, tourism raises awareness and brings in funds for preservation, but it also means more people walking around these precious artworks. When you think of the Sahara Desert today, it's all about vast stretches of sand and scorching heat, right? But believe it or not, this wasn't always the case. There's a whole hidden history beneath those dunes, and it's been uncovered through the study of fossils and isotope analysis. So let's dive into this hidden past. The Sahara has turned up fossils of all sorts of aquatic life. We're talking fish, mollusks, and even plants. And these aren't just any old fossils. They're often in great condition, which is pretty wild considering they've been under the desert for ages. These fossils got preserved because they were quickly buried under sediments in ancient lakes and rivers, which kept them safe from decay. And the dating of these fossils? It goes back millions of years, painting a long history of environmental change in the Sahara. Now these fossils tell us a lot about what the Sahara used to be like. Fish fossils suggest there were rivers and lakes around, while marine shells hint at the possibility of larger water bodies, maybe even shallow seas. Plus, the variety of species points to a time when the Sahara was home to rich and diverse ecosystems. But here's where it gets even more interesting. These fossils aren't just found in one spot, they're all over the Sahara, which means these water bodies were widespread. Satellite imagery and geological surveys have even mapped out ancient river systems that line up with where these fossils were found. And there's a lot of variation in the types and amounts of fossils in different areas, showing just how diverse the climate and environment were across the Sahara. Then there's isotope analysis, which is like a detective tool for figuring out past climates. By looking at the ratios of certain isotopes in sediment layers, scientists can work out past temperatures and rainfall. Higher ratios of oxygen-18, for example, usually mean more evaporation, pointing to warmer, drier periods. Carbon isotopes can tell us about the types of plants that were around, giving clues about how much rain there was. If you mention the word Atlantis to, to any archaeologist, they will tend to roll their eyes. The fittingly named Eye of the Sahara is by far the most likely location for the lost capital city of Atlantis. When you look at all of the areas around the planet that have been proposed for Atlantis, I think there's one place that fits the majority of his details, and that's the sunken Azores Plateau. The Reichat structure, often referred to as the Eye of the Sahara, is a remarkable and unique geological formation with some fascinating features. Spanning about 40 kilometers in diameter, it's so large that it can be easily spotted from space. The structure isn't a perfect circle, but rather takes on a slightly elliptical dome shape, adding to its mystique. One of the most striking aspects of the Rishat structure is its series of concentric rings. These rings are quite intriguing because they're not all the same. They vary in terms of their width, what they're made of, and how they've eroded over time. This creates a complex, layered look that's quite captivating. The rim rock of this is late Cretaceous, about 90 million years old. So at that point, it was below the ocean, right? Mm. So it's been uplifted. I think this thing is about 14 or 1500 feet above sea level. So it's been eroded. You see this whole thing here is like an erosion. The way these rings have formed is a tale of erosion at work. Over millions of years, forces of nature like wind and water have eroded the dome, unveiling these distinct rings. Each layer of the structure erodes differently, depending on how tough or soft it is, which is why we see this range of rings. 
Now let's talk about what the Rishat structure is made of because it's quite a mix. The outer rings are primarily made of something called Proterozoic Quartzite. This is a very hard rock that's resistant to weathering, and it's incredibly old. We're talking over 600 million years. Quartzite forms from sandstone that's been put under a lot of heat and pressure, so it's been through a lot. As we move towards the inner rings, the story changes. Here we find softer, sedimentary rocks like limestone and sandstone. Limestone, primarily composed of calcium carbonate, typically forms in old marine environments. Sandstone, on the other hand, is made up of sand-like mineral particles. Right at the center, the Rishat structure has something called silicious breccia, which is basically a bunch of angular rock fragments stuck together. Breccia usually forms in areas with lots of volcanic activity or where the Earth's crust has been moving and shaking. All these different rock types in one place make the Rishat structure quite special. Not only is it a visually stunning landmark, but it's also a valuable spot for geologists to study. So the connection to ancient Egypt that Solon draws and Plato passes on is actually very real. It's very, it's very solid. And I'm pleased to say that there has now been a full translation of the Edfu text. When it comes to how the Rishat structure was formed, there are a couple of theories floating around. The most widely accepted one is what geologists call the uplifted dome theory. In simple terms, this theory suggests that natural forces beneath the Earth's surface pushed up layers of rock, creating a sort of bulge on the surface. Over time, this dome was worn down by erosion, which is basically the wind and water gradually wearing away the rock. This erosion didn't happen uniformly. The softer rocks wore down faster than the harder ones, leading to the formation of those distinctive concentric rings we see today. Now, there's another, more speculative theory proposed by Jimmy Corsetti. He's got this interesting idea that the near-perfect circular shape and unique layering of the Rychat structure might not be all natural. He thinks that ancient human activities might have played a part in shaping it. The circular ring city was also said to have an opening to the sea at the south, which not only matches the southerly opening of the Rishat anomaly, but it even has existing evidence of a flow of salt water that is still visible to this day. The environment of the Sahara Desert has also played a significant role in the process of the Rychat structure formation. The dry, arid conditions mean that wind erosion is particularly influential in shaping the structure. And let's not forget that the Sahara hasn't always been a desert. It has gone through various climatic changes over millions of years, and these changes have influenced the rate and nature of erosion in the region. Some of the rocks there are incredibly old, dating back to over 600 million years ago. This period covers a huge chunk of our planet's past, from about 2.5 billion to 541 million years ago. It's a crucial era for understanding how continents formed and how early life evolved. Now, imagine the amount of time it took to form the Rechat structure. It's been shaped over millions and millions of years. A lot of factors played a role in shaping the Rechat structure. Movements in the Earth's crust, like the shifting of tectonic plates, have been a big part of it. Then there's the impact of climate changes over the ages, especially in the Sahara region. All these changes influenced the patterns of erosion that gave the structure its current look. And speaking of erosion, it's been the main force sculpting and exposing the different layers of rock in the Rychat structure. One of the coolest things about the Rishat structure is its distinct circular pattern. As said before, it's so noticeable that astronauts use it as a landmark when they're up in space. This pattern really stands out against the surrounding desert landscape. If you take the concept of Atlantis seriously, you're regarded by archaeologists and their friends in the media as a kind of lunatic. And I've always found this odd because, because the source, the earliest surviving source for the tradition of Atlantis is the highly respected figure of Plato. Plato's description of Atlantis found in his dialogues, Timaeus and Critias, really captures the imagination, doesn't it? Written around 360 BC, these works come from a time when Athens was at the height of its philosophical and cultural influence. Plato was a thinker who loved to dive deep into ideas about society, morality and reality, and he used these dialogues as a way to explore these themes. It's kind of like he was having a conversation through his characters which let him present different ideas and arguments. Now, about Atlantis itself, it's described as this massive island city located beyond the Pillars of Hercules, which most people think is the Strait of Gibraltar. 
Plato went all out in describing it as bigger than Libya and Asia combined, which really paints a picture of its mythical size. The city layout is fascinating, with these concentric circles of land and water. Imagine the engineering it would have taken to build something like that in ancient times, complete with canals and bridges connecting everything. The heart of the island, its central plain, was said to be super fertile, perfect for farming, and it was surrounded by high mountains rich in resources and natural protection. And Atlantis wasn't just about impressive landscapes, it was also a hub of resources and technology. Plato talks about it having all sorts of metals, including this mysterious orichalcum as well as gold and silver. The infrastructure was top-notch, with water systems, temples, palaces and docks. But Atlantis wasn't just about buildings and resources. Plato describes it as having a complex society with its own laws, customs and political organization. It even had a powerful military. Yet in his story, Atlantis starts as this ideal place and then becomes corrupt and ultimately falls. Plato includes precise scientific information in the story. And this is what archaeology is ignoring uh, when it says that it's all a fantastical made-up tale. And it, it's to do with that meltwater pulse 1b that I mentioned that, uh, that, that brought the Younger Dryas to an end 11,600 years ago and raised sea levels massively. Now let's talk about the theory connecting the Rishat structure, also known as the Eye of the Sahara, to the legendary city of Atlantis, as described by Plato. It's quite a fascinating topic, especially the ideas presented by Jimmy Corsetti. Here's where it gets interesting. Corsetti and some others have pointed out that these rings bear a striking resemblance to Plato's Atlantis, which in his dialogues Timaeus and Critias was described as having similar concentric circles of land and water. Now, while geologists understand these rings in the Rishat structure as a result of natural erosion processes, the similarity to the mythical Atlantis has sparked quite a bit of interest and speculation. When you compare the size of the Rishat structure to what Plato described for Atlantis, there seem to be some parallels, although there are notable differences in the exact measurements. Corsetti's theory even suggests that changes like erosion over time could have altered the Rishat structure's appearance, possibly bringing it closer to what Plato described. But here's a major twist in the tale. The Rishat structure is smack in the middle of the Sahara Desert, while Plato's Atlantis was described as an island in the Atlantic Ocean. This stark difference in geographical context has led to some interesting speculation. Some theorists propose that the landscape around the Rishat structure might have been very different in the past, possibly closer to water, or even more hospitable than the Sahara we know today. And he's shown writings on the walls by the priests. And he says, what do these writings say? And the priests then unravel the whole story of Atlantis, and they tell how there was this great advanced civilization, uh, which, uh, which at one time was, was extremely beneficial and positive to the world, but which fell out of harmony with the universe. The Eye of the Sahara is quite an archaeological goldmine. In this particular region, a variety of artifacts have been found, shedding light on the lives of people who lived there thousands of years ago. We're talking about stone tools like arrowheads, scrapers and axes that were probably used for hunting and crafting. These tools tell us a lot about the daily activities and skills of these ancient folks. Then there's the pottery. Finding fragments of pottery in the area is like getting a glimpse into their domestic life. It shows that they had developed pottery-making skills, which is a big deal in understanding the cultural and technological progress of any civilization. And you know what's even more intriguing? There are hints of more permanent forms of settlement. Although it's not definitive, the remnants of structures could mean that these were not just nomadic people passing through, but a community that settled down. But here's where it gets really interesting, the rock paintings and engravings. These are found on cliff faces and in caves right around the Rishat structure. The artwork is not just beautiful, it's like a storybook of ancient life. There are paintings of animals like antelopes, elephants and giraffes, suggesting a time when the Sahara was teeming with wildlife. Then there are human figures depicted in various activities, giving us a sneak peek into their social and cultural practices. And the symbols and abstract designs might even point to their spiritual beliefs. Dating these rock arts can be tricky, but many are believed to be from the Neolithic period. This suggests that the region had a thriving community during that era. It's not just about finding old stuff, it's about piecing together the story of human habitation and development in the area. The presence of these artifacts and artworks indicates that there was a stable human population at some point. 
The possibility of permanent settlements, while not confirmed, is certainly tantalizing and calls for more extensive archaeological research. These findings are like puzzle pieces that help us understand the prehistoric Sahara, which was once a greener, more hospitable place than it is today. They tell a story of human adaptation and migration, of how people responded to the climatic changes that turned the Sahara into the desert we know now. It's not just about the history of a particular region, it's about adding to the rich tapestry of African prehistory and understanding the diversity and complexity of early human societies on the continent. Isn't it amazing how much we can learn about our past from the things left behind in the sands of time?